Hey, hey, this is Stephanie from Apex Languages. Are you ready to learn some new grammar? Hopefully you are. Today we're going to talk about yes, no questions. We've been talking about pronouns and the next set are the interrogative or question pronouns. Therefore, I figured it was a good idea to first review the basics of how to form a question. Admittedly, English has a strange way of doing this, and so even at the advanced level, many students still struggle with the things I'm about to talk about. But questions are everywhere, aren't they? And so it's important to master them. Don't you agree? So as I said before, today's focus will be on questions, specifically yes, no questions. That is to say, questions that anticipate either a yes or a no for an answer. I'll be covering four techniques used to create different types of these questions. Inflection, inversion, deletion, and do. First, let's talk about inflection because it's the easiest to form. Inflection refers to the way your voice changes in order to indicate different shades of meaning. In English, we raise our voice at the end of a sentence if it meant to be a question. Sometimes that's all you need to do. Nothing else has to be added or switched around. The writing equivalent to this is simply adding a question mark, as in the example below. Now, the thing about this approach is that it adds very strong subtext to your question. Yes, ultimately you're still looking for a yes or a no answer, but at the same time, you're insinuating a great deal of doubt or maybe surprise depending on exactly what tones you use and which words you stress. So the basic statement is, you're here. Okay, my tone stays pretty flat. You're here. Sounds a little disappointing almost. When I make it a question, you're here. Okay, so you're here, you're here. There's a little raise at the end. And this is me saying, I'm looking around, I don't see you. I'm a little surprised, I, I, I'm a little doubtful. Okay, I don't really believe it because I don't see you. I can add a little bit more excitement to that. You're here? That, that's maybe, uh, I hear a little bit of fear. <laughs> that's the, um, when you're getting ready for a party and you still have an hour's worth of work and somebody texts you and says, I'm here, I'm coming in. That's the, the fear, okay? So just, you're here, right? I don't see you, I'm kind of surprised. I don't believe it. You're here, okay? It's a little stronger, a little higher. There's a little bit of fear in there. Either way, these are both questions. I've taken a sentence and turned it into a question. Another example, it's free. It's free, that would be with an exclamation point. But if I've got a question mark, it's free. I don't believe it, right? It's too good to be true. Another example, I like this, that's a statement. I like this, that's with an exclamation mark. But for a question, I like this, Okay, someone is saying that you tried it before, you loved it, and I'm looking at the plate saying, I don't think so. Um, so that's the tone that changes, but you can also change the stress on different words. I like this, I like this. When you add stress on different words, it can change the sentence subtly. Okay, uh, in the first sentence, you're here, you're here, right? Which one are you really questioning? You're here, here like where I am, or you're here? Then you're questioning which person? Maybe I'm expecting someone else, but if I say you're here, then I'm saying, wait, you're not supposed to be here, someone else is supposed to be here. So, you know, keep that in mind. You can create questions just by the way you say things. 
Now we're going to make things a little more complicated and move on to inversion. This is where we change the fundamental structure of the basic English sentence. What is that order again? Ah yes, subject, verb, and optionally direct and or indirect objects. We'll start with the sentence, you are here. You may have noticed that the object changed to a complement. And that's because technically copulas like to be do not actually take a direct object. The nouns, adjectives, and adjoining phrases that follow to be are actually called complements, specifically subject complements. That's not something that you really have to worry about, but I'm saying it officially for the record here so that no one complains to me about it later. While I'm on the subject, allow me to point out quickly the difference between complement with an E and complement with an I. They're homophones, which means that they sound exactly alike, yay, but the one spelled with an I on the bottom means to say something nice to someone, and the one with an E on the top means to go well with something, as in you and here go well together in this sentence. In any case, you are here. In order to convert that statement into a question in English, you switch or invert the subject and the verb so that the verb comes first. The question now reads, are you here? The most important thing to keep in mind about inversion is that only certain verbs can do it. Those are the auxiliary verbs, the helping verbs and they include be, have, and do. Uh, a major subset of auxiliaries are also the modals, which include can, could, may, might, shall, should, will, and would. Uh, they're just a group that uh, don't like to follow the rules. They get a lot of exceptions, including this inversion rule. So when you look at the sentence, are you here? Well, that works because it uses the auxiliary be. Be, of course, is I am, you are, they were, I was, right? All of those are be. Be is a very irregular verb. Um, but here you've got another verb, have. You have done it. Now, we could go back uh, with inflection and say, you have done it. That's what I say whenever my children's uh, report that they finished cleaning their room. I don't believe it, or maybe I'm surprised. All right, so you have done it, you've done it. Okay, again, you can play around with different tones for different meanings, but um, you know, that's just, uh, you know, changing the tone of your voice to create a question. But inversion would have me switching have and you, and then the question is, have you done it? So there it's not so much that I'm expressing doubt or surprise. It's just this very basic yes or no question. Have you done it? I'm just checking. I'm not, there's no judgment, right? Just want to know, have you done it? Yes or no? Uh, with the modals, can you do it, right? The statement is, you can do it. The question is, can you do it? or will you do it? That brings me to deletion. Now deletion isn't really a standard rule, a traditional rule. Traditional grammarians would have a heart attack if they knew I was telling you about this, but it's very common in very informal situations. When you talk with your friends, um, this is very common. Well, deletion is when you get rid of a word. The first thing is that it will not work in all scenarios where you use inversion. It only works with auxiliaries. So let's go back to have you done it. Uh, the problem is that the modals have too much information, but the auxiliaries are very, they're blank slates. They don't have meaning on their own. They're there for grammatical function. And so because of that, it doesn't really matter as much if you get rid of them. They don't have meaning, they just have function. So, like I said, deletion very simply is deleting a word. Which word? 
the, sub, the, the verb. Okay, so instead of saying, have you done it? You done it? Keep in mind, I still have my past participle here because the original was ha uh, you have done it, right? Have plus the past participle is my present perfect. So it's important that I keep the grammar the same. I'm just making the have invisible. It's still there, but it's invisible. You see a deletion too with, for example, that um, in clauses. Um, I always called it the ghost that, and, and we'll talk about that sooner than later, actually. But um, this is, uh, as far as questions go, you're deleting the verb so that you can't see it, but it's still understood that it's there. Again, this is a very informal um, option. Let's look here. Are you here? That was our original sentence. You here? Okay. That's something that you would text a friend, right? Because English speakers are lazy. Our tongues are very lazy. Our fingers are very lazy. We don't want to write, are you here? That's exhausting. <laughs> we just say, you here? Back to more serious, or at least traditional grammar, do. Do is what you do with all of the verbs that are not auxiliary. So, goodbye. Study, for example, just to pick a random word. Now, if I did that usual inversion trick with study, and I said, study you here, it's wrong. Don't do that. Why? Why does it work for the auxiliaries and it doesn't work for the regular verbs? What are you supposed to do with the regular verbs? Well, we actually have to go back to those auxiliaries. Remember, do is a helping verb. And so the sentence that English speakers actually want, for whatever reason, is you do study here. Okay, you do study here. When we have a negative sentence, we say you don't study here. And so that do is always invisible. It's always ghost, right? But we don't normally say it. We only use it for emphasis, right? You, you study? I, well, I am studying, you know, do you study? I do, I do, really, I do. I'm using it for emphasis. So do is kind of weird because it's always present, but um, it's invisible. Basically, it's kind of like um, make, you know, and I know like in Spanish, they have us there for, for um, you know, doing things, making things. And so are you, one big thing with Spanish speakers is exercise. They say, I do exercise um, or I, I make exercise because uh, in Spanish, I said ejercicios. That's always the same, but in English, it's just exercise. It's the same idea there, though, that we we do exercises. That's what we're thinking in our head. The do is just invisible. It's just the way that the language worked out. So, you know, over time, we've got rid of it for most of the time when we use a verb, but it's still there when we want negatives, when we want questions. It's weird. Work with me here. Okay, but that's the logic. So my sentence is, you do study here. Do is the auxiliary. Study is actually an infinitive. So do study. It's an infinitive without two. It's a noun, basically. It's the complement of my sentence. Well, what do we do with do? What do we do with auxiliaries? We invert them. And so this is where we switch do and you to form the question. Okay, do you study here? So we're not putting study in front because study is the infinitive. It's a noun. It just stays in the complement space. It doesn't move around. But do and you, you and do are the ones that flip spaces. Do you come often? So you could say you come often. Okay, you do come often, but when it's a question, do you come often? 
You sing well. That's the statement. You sing well. Well, do you sing well? You like this. You like this? Remember that one? Well, do you like this? Then, of course, uh, with any, uh, any inversion is the possibility of deletion, so keep that in mind as well. Do you like this? Uh, if you're texting your friend, you might just write, you like this. You get rid of the do, but it's still there. It's always, do is always there. It's always taunting us. Keep that in mind. So those are the most important techniques for forming yes or no questions. But what if you want an answer that's not yes or no? Well, in that case, you're going to need question words, including our interrogative pronouns, which will be the subject for next week's video. In the meanwhile, practice makes perfect. Here's a basic assignment for you. Send me a question about English. Any question you want. English grammar, English vocabulary. The important thing is that you're practicing writing questions. So get to it. Thank you as always for watching my videos. Check out more at apexlanguages.com. Have a wonderful, safe, healthy day.